Lord. This is our Father's Day. Amen. All right, well, listen, if you would like, you can take your Bibles and open to the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at the 45th chapter, and I'm going to be speaking on Wellsprings. And as I address that topic of Wellsprings, I'm also going to address the subject of springtime, which is now winding down, but it is an incredible time. And it's something that I, I've learned to appreciate more than where I grew up at, because where I grew up in California, spring time lasted a week or two. The fall lasted a week or two. And the rest of the time, it was either hot or sometimes it rained. And that was about it. We didn't have a sp really a spring or a fall. And the, the joy of having full seasons is just awesome. I love springtime. Yeah, yeah, because spring brings rejuvenation in life. That is a natural aspect of our planet, the recycling of seasons. All of our outdoor gardeners, like my wife, appreciate this time of year. And I appreciate it even more. Uh, my wife was just gone for a few days in her garden. I had to tend it. I had to water it. I had to look out for it. And I'm really appreciative of the work that she puts in to, to produce those vegetables. And I'm glad I don't have to do that every day. She ended up making that, that statement about, about seasons. I want you to also understand, God desires to bring rejuvenation and life to your dreams and to your calling. And there is a wellspring of his goodness that is just waiting to break forth in your life. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in a dark season of the soul, somewhat akin to winter, where it's cold, it's hard, it's difficult, where nothing seems to be going right. And when we're in those seasons, even though we don't like to admit it, there, when we're in those times of life, we can be tempted to ask, God, where are you? Where are you in this thing that I'm going through? Why can't I find you? I think all of us, at times, have experienced the truth that life can be complicated. Life can be difficult. We can be accosted with health issues, relational issues, financial issues, improper governmental intrusions and abuse of power issues. <laughs> A whole assortment of difficulties and complications. Well, the reason why I chose this passage of Scripture is to help us see that if we are in that type of a season, that the Lord is here to help you to answer the life questions that you face. And this passage of Scripture helps us to discern the keys, the ability to overcome. Isaiah 45, verses 28 through 45, 25, is a complicated passage, this, this passage about a king, Cyrus, an anointing he carried. And it's one that in recent past has been in the forefront of many of us within the body of Christ. It is a complicated passage of scripture to interpret. As it directly assails our thoughts on prophecy and our place in the plan God's plan of our generation, as in any generation when anointing is considered. Sometimes it can be difficult to see ourselves included in the divine landscape, and we think life just happens, and can anything prevent it? Can anything stop it? Well, you know, this passage of Scripture, if you look at it in depth, you're going to find that conservative interpreters use this passage to validate the prophetic nature of Scripture, to showcase how God can use evil, people, heathens, heathen governments to advance his purpose. Liberal theologians and commentators will usually cite this same passage as a reason against prophecy as they struggle with Isaiah's vivid depiction of a king who many theologians believed wouldn't be born for another hundred years after the prophecy was given. Others hold that Isaiah's reference to Cyrus dates Isaiah as being a, la a latter rather than an earlier prophet. So there's different views, which helps to make it hard to understand, hard to interpret. But there's one thing I do know. Scripture and faith will always rest on trusting in God's ability to understand the future and on occasion to intervene in its progression and to bring his will to earth. So with that in mind, I want you to look with me today as we see how Isaiah shows us that the Lord has created first 
wellsprings of open blessing. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. Rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. That's Isaiah 45, verses 1, 2, and 8. Well, friends, I want you to understand this is truth. And there is a powerful truth that underlie this passage of Scripture. And that truth is that God loves to display his love and his power for his people to the nations. He wants others to know how good he is, how kind he is, how gracious he is. As I noted earlier, this passage really is complicated. Very complicated. Because most see or interpret Cyrus as a clear illustration of prophetic foretelling. Now, I believe that to be true with all my being. But I also think that there's more to the story than just a prophecy about an individual and the interference of God in the affairs of a nation and a people. You see, Isaiah's listeners, the generation that he was prophesying to, they would have been absolutely astonished, dumbfounded with the word that Isaiah presented in this passage of Scripture. Without equivocation, this is something that would have shocked them. First, it would have been because of Isaiah's identification of a pagan king. Cyrus as being God's shepherd. That would have made sprockets spring. They would have went ballistic. It's what do you mean that a unrighteous pagan king would ever be considered God's shepherd? The shepherd of his people. Secondly, they would have freaked out over Cyrus being called God's anointed. Shepherd and anointed? No way. Can't happen. We're talking paganism. We're talking people that are antithetical to the concept of serving and knowing God. It would be like us as Christians. One day advocating for a candidate for president who lived a godless and moral life for most of his life, who was accused of being a tax manipulator, a cheat, you know, all kinds of other things. And us as the body of Christ saying, this is the man we're voting for. That's how they would have viewed it. Incredulous. Who would have ever thought something like that could happen? Not in our generation. Oh, wait a minute. You see what I did there? <laughs> they would have had that type of a reaction. Both the Christian and non-Christian community would accuse anyone who attempted to do that of hypocrisy. A behavior that is unbecoming of a believer. To ever advocate for someone who seemed to live below their moral standard and their moral perception of what is right. Additionally, this passage has been used many times to proclaim God's control over the nations and the affairs of men. And people don't often like to admit that. I believe that. But again, I think there's more to the story, to the prophecy. Later, many years later, a different prophet would rise onto the scene. We call him John the Beloved, John the Apostle, John the Revelator, John who wrote the book of Revelation under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Well, John would tell us that we who are the body of Christ, that we have been called kings and priests of the Most High God in his kingdom as he echoes Isaiah's proclamation and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 1. Here's what I think about the deeper meaning, the deeper truth of this passage. This passage of Scripture 
has to do with us, you and me, those of us who are the body of Christ. And it has to do with God's using us, using people who had been heathen, who had been Gentiles, people who were not part of the promised people, the Jewish people, to advance his will on earth. That here in the middle of Isaiah, you see a point of identification beginning to merge about the nature of the church's anointing and calling and purpose, which is your anointing and calling and purpose if you are identified as one who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You see, Cyrus was a vessel that would bring anointing and blessing. But you know what? So are you, if you're the redeemed of the Lord. And if you are the redeemed of the Lord, if that's who you are, you've been grafted into the stock of Israel. Paul says we've been grafted into the vine. The very purposes of what the Father had always deliberated on, of bringing the revelation of who he is to humanity, that he's gracious and kind, that he's compassionate, that his arm is not short, and he is looking to redeem anyone and everyone that would come into that circle of his grace. That he is here for everyone that is in that cause, everyone that needs him. And that he is not excluding anyone on his own deliberate purpose. This is God speaking to everyone who are goyim, non-Jewish in saying, I will raise up a people who come from a different stock, who come from a different background, who come from a different influence, and I will make them the redeemed. I will make them the people of promise. I will make them the ones who cause the kingdom of God to move forward, the promises to be fulfilled, for God's name to be made great, for his renown to be known throughout the earth. And I believe that this is what the Cyrus passage is really about. Because, again, Cyrus was the vessel that would bring anointing and blessing, just like we are anointed to bring that blessing. I believe that the real purpose of the Cyrus passage, the Cyrus anointing, is to point us to the work of Jesus on the earth. You see, Jesus' words and his work are synonymous one with another. His words and his works blend perfectly together to advance his cause. And we are people of his word, and we are people who accomplish his works on earth. That's what we are. That's who we're called to be. I want you to think about this for a moment. This passage is in the middle of the most openly predictive prophetic book in the Old Testament. When the Jewish people were closing their canon on what books they would determine to be Scripture, Even though Isaiah was the most predictive book, they went ahead and kept it in. Predictive meaning pointing to Jesus. The Jewish people excluded a whole bunch of writings that they had had elevated to levels of Scripture, but they excluded them because they spoke too much about what people would point to and say, that's what Jesus fulfilled. But when it came to Isaiah, Isaiah the great prophet, the greatest of all the prophets of Israel, they couldn't exclude him. And they went ahead and left him in. And so now here, here in this portion of the book of Isaiah, that middle portion of Isaiah's breath of Jesus Christ, the 40th through the 57th chapter, you see Jesus everywhere. And so right at the heart of this, right in Isaiah 45, you see Jesus. You see Jesus taking and lifting up pagan kings and utilizing them for his glory. And then John later saying that we are kings and priests in his kingdom, raising us up to use for his glory, to take his word to the nation, to take his name to the nation. For we who are the church to rise up, to stand in our calling, to never back down from who we have been called to be, and to advance in every way that he has said that we should move forward. You know, I was blessed this week in a, in a very unusual way. Caught wind of a testimony. Someone in our church is talking with someone in the Philippines. And, you know, as you know, the internet has made the world really small. It shrunk. And so there's these two people, male and female, communicating online. 
using dating services, all the different things, and Philippines and United States. Kind of cool, you know, but nothing unusual. Until one of, the, one of the persons where they're at, they didn't have access to the internet, had to go to church to borrow the computer to be able to connect, to talk with this person. So they're having their chat. And as they're chatting, the pastor happens to walk by. And all of a sudden, there's a conversation that the person didn't understand everything that was being said, but all of a sudden, the name Floodgate in Brighton, Michigan, in English, popped up. Well, apparently, the pastor began to talk about how he had heard about a church in Brighton, Michigan that never shut down. What? Isn't that cool? (laughs) Floodgate, they are talking about you around the world. The stand that we took for Jesus in refusing to shut our doors, in refusing to allow a government to oppress us and say that we, the people who belong to Christ, cannot worship God freely, even though our Constitution guarantees us that right, they're talking about the stand we took and the way we said, not on our watch, we will not do it. We did it together. We have done something. We, we are making a mark, and people are talking about this little church that thought it could, so it did. Thank you. And then I heard another person say, oh, yeah, I have a friend in, in, in Australia who watches us every week online because their church shut down, and they heard that there was a church in Brighton, Michigan, that never did, that still broadcasts its services. And so they looked us up online and they watch us every week. They're part of our family. We are impacting the world. Who would have ever thought out of Michigan in a little community called Brighton that we would be touching and encouraging people around the world? That is what is happening. Let Jesus be glorified. It's cool. Who would have ever thought what you did in making a stand for Christ is bringing him great glory and encouraging people throughout the world? Uh, It's pretty amazing. So, this passage of scripture, it helps us to see how 700 years before Jesus was born, the Father knew what he would do and how Jesus' work would affect us. Father God also knew you. He knows you, and he knew what you could achieve, and he knows what you can achieve, which is what brings me to my second point, well springs of well. Isaiah 45, again, the third and 14th verse reads like this, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and of the Sabians. Men of stature shall come over to you and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you. They shall come over in chains and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other. There is no other God. You know, this passage of scripture in in this portion is, is just an amazing one because it speaks about wealth and it speaks about oppression. It speaks about wealth and it speaks about captivity. And I'm going to share with you what I believe about this. When, when, when Isaiah is talking about captivity, he is speaking about something that everyone is destined for who opposes the anointing, who opposes Jesus, the anointed one, who opposes the anointed ones of the Lord, of which we are. I think this past year we, we've seen a clear demonstration of a separation between levels of faith and levels of belief and levels of acceptance. is in, in, in the dynamic of what happened this past year, there are still churches that are shut down. As I reflect back one year ago from today, 
I was just starting to think, you know, I'm going to make it without getting arrested. <laughs> Seriously. It was every Sunday. It was, I always had that wary eye out. Are they going to come and take me away? Ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he. <laughs> they didn't. It wasn't until about a year ago from right now where I started to think we're in the clear because I knew that they were starting to talk about allowing churches to regather. When they started to allow churches to regather at the end of June, beginning of July, we saw what transpired. Churches imposed draconian restrictions that reflected what the government was doing. You want to go to church, you have to wear a mask, you have to social distance, you have to register. Up until this last season, the only places you had to register to go to church was if you were in a communist country. We have seen a separation of goats and sheep. We are seeing different levels of faith that are being expressed. And we who are the body of Christ, we need to understand that the church will be led in chains of captivity until we who are the leaders of the church and the people of the church rise up and say, we will not be shackled, we will not be oppressed, we will not give in, we will not give in, we will be those who rise up and make a stand for our Lord Jesus. When we look at Scripture, we understand this about captivity. Demons will submit and will be chained. Treasuries of darkness will be turned over. But we also understand kingdom expansion will always be sure. And we understand this. The material treasures belong to the redeemed. See, the Old Testament concept of blessing is demonstrated by wealth. God, God's blessing was seen as wealth. Now here we see a focus on demonic and material things. And I think this is important because in our age, wealth is always seen as a means in which you have power. But in our kingdom, the kingdom that we have been transferred into, there is a different conception of wealth that has been demonstrated through Jesus. And that is this. Wealth is no longer defined by silver and gold. Wealth is defined by people. People are the treasure of heaven. And the church is the treasury. One of the worst things that happened in this past year is we saw the treasury of heaven depleted because people were not allowed to gather in the treasure house. And we're now seeing the net result of it because there are a lot of people that just simply, they're not going back to church. They're not doing it. And, and you know, I'm on a, a number of different, uh, different sites where, with pastors where we talk about different things, and I just hear them over and over. They're not coming back. They're not coming back. There's no indication they're coming back. And everyone is dialing down. They're lessening their expectations of what they think will happen. And they're asking the questions, well, why aren't they coming back? I'll tell you one of the reasons why. The shepherds weren't there to minister to them in some of their darkest and hardest times. And we who are the shepherds, we need to rise up and apologize to the people for our lack of faith for that demonstration that we gave that they're not important. You see, the church, the treasury of God's kingdom, needs to be filled with items of value. And as I look out and I look at you, I see a lot of valuable commodity. We who are the body of Christ, we contain the riches of heaven. We know that God will see us through the trying times of life. The language in the second and third verse is reminiscent of the Exodus. I want you to hear me on this. There is no obstruction of power that can ever prevent us from advancing as we follow the Lord's lead. And by the way, do you guys mind if I take a little extra time? Oh, good, because I was going to do it anyways. <laughs> But just letting you know that I do realize right now is when I should be stopping. <laughs> there is no obstruction or power that can prevent you from advancing as you follow the Lord's lead. Pharaohs, oceans, rivers, deserts, they all have to submit to the king who's redeemed us. Obstructions that seem to shut us out are removed. God is removing obstructions. On Friday, we saw an obstruction removed. I was able to put pen to paper. 
and sign a contract for 1535 old US 23. We've entered into contract on striking lanes bowling alley. The engineer has told us that the building is large enough that we could actually host 2,000 people. Unfortunately, the piece of land that we're buying isn't big enough to allow for the parking spaces for that many people. But we're still, without adding additional land, we are, we are going to be able to be approved for 12 to 1,400 people, give or take a couple. So, uh, yeah, we, we either need to add a little more land so that we can bump it up or, or when the time comes to bump it up, you know, because we're not going to put, well, I shouldn't say that. Don't say not. When we open the doors, 2,000 people show up. We want to make sure we we're ready for them. Yeah. <laughs> Obstructions are removed from before the Lord. When God places his blessing on open display, there are natural results that follow. People have seen the blessing of God resting upon you. He knows. He knows that he can show his goodness where there are people who are willing to stand for faith and stand for his kingdom. In terms of those natural results, we come to know the goodness of God, of his hand extended toward us. That you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, then the people who know the Lord are enabled to come into the realization that God is more than capable of meeting us where we reside. I love how, how Isaiah records this. I have even called you by your name. I've named you, though you have not known me. This is an indication of God raising up people who come from heathen extraction, from heathen backgrounds, those people that were not the children of promise, the children of Abraham, and making them the children of Abraham. He knew your name before you knew him. He named you before you were named. He knew that you would bear the name of Jesus Christ, that the Lord's name would be, would be inscribed upon the doorposts of your heart for all men to read and see that God is good. Finally, the world is made aware of the goodness of the Lord through our demonstration as being his anointed. You see, Isaiah's prophetic picture blends perfectly with the Great Commission, with the impartation that Jesus released into us to equip us for the ministry of advancing his name, of honoring him, of making him renowned throughout the earth. His anointing brings an advanced force into a city, into a region, into a state, and beyond as God goes before us as conquerors and prepares the way for us. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's Luke chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, and Isaiah 40, verses 3, uh, 3 through 5. This is what we're doing next week, friends, and what we have done repeatedly throughout the years in our outreaches, our park outreaches, going to Hash Bash, going to Gay Pride, going wherever we could take the word of the Lord to having our conferences to bring about a release of anointing, this is what we do. You see, we look at Detroit and we say that is not a city to be forsaken, not a city to be abandoned. And regardless of what type of opposition that Antifa, BLM, uh, the, the whoever's and the whatever's want to bring against us, we say to that city that is ours, it belongs to us just as it belongs to everyone else in this region. And our city, our city will be seated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will go into the heart of the city and we will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We will worship him openly. We will worship him freely. And we will welcome his presence to rain down upon our land. Amen. Amen. We will remind God of his promises to us. We will remind him that this city belongs to the Lord. We will remind him that the people of the city, that we claim them as our treasurer, and that we are coming as a force. We are coming as a force into Michigan, into Detroit, anywhere where they will let us. We will rise up against the darkness, we will rise up against the oppression, and we will bring the presence of God to rest upon this land, because this is our city, this is our region, this is our state, and we refuse to turn it over to the rulers of darkness, to the powers and principalities, whether they are in Detroit or Lansing, 
we say to them they must bow to Jesus. This, my friend, is how we fight our battles. And we fight because we know God is on our side. Third, let me talk about wellsprings of words of honor. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I've named you, though you've not known me. Or Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I've named you, though you've not known me. Rain down, rain down down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness let the earth open let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together i the lord have created i have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth i do not say to the seed of jacob seek me in vain i the lord speak righteousness i declare things that are right isaiah 45 4 8 and 19 friends understand this god speaks good things over you he speaks good things over me. He eulogizes us. Eulogy simply means speaking well of. It's not restricted to speaking words about a person's life when they passed. When we speak well of people, we are speaking words of affirmation and we are saying this is what reality is and this is what we reflect. God is eulogizing us. This is like where we read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul makes that declaration in Ephesians chapter 1. This means that even when we were on the outs, we're on the in. We're known by the Lord. He has made us to be known by him. You see, words of prophetic blessing like what we did with these kids. These are blessings that are waiting to be sprung from the wellsprings of the Lord's goodness. Where we are saying, this is what we expect. This is what we trust, God, you will do. And where we understand that as his people, God honors us as his blessed. See, open heavens, raining down blessings. You know, when we contrast the natural and the invisible realms, we see that both produce yields. They both produce crops. When righteousness rains down, we, the church, produce great works for the Lord. When unrighteousness rains down, you see the church shut up, shut out, and stop from advancing. And we say, no. The reins of righteousness will determine the outcome. And we will stand for our God and King, and we will not let the church be shut. We will not let it be diminished. And we will speak to the people and say, in spite of what the government has done and in spite of whatever connections people in the church have made to governments, we reject that and there is a good thing that is just waiting to break forth from our God into this land. See, righteousness in this context equates as actions. Again, God's words are the same as his actions. That should be us as well. We demonstrate God's righteousness by our actions of obedience, by our supernatural anointing that we walk in. And we understand that God never speaks in secret. He lets us in on his ways. He lets us know his thoughts. He lets us think his thoughts after himself. It's Jesus' intention to put us on open display as valued servants. And going back to that Cyrus illustration, Isaiah points this out to us in that first verse as he identifies Father God, Yahweh, holding Cyrus's hand, where it says, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, you know, I, I love the depiction there. Is it reminds me of when I'm with my, what, my grandchildren. You know, I like to take their hand. I did it with my boys when they were young. I'd take them, take them by the hand if something startled them, if there was something that, was, that, that made them a little bit afraid. When you take their hand, when you take the hand of a child, you're letting them know that whatever's in front of them that is causing them to fear, whether it be person or thing, you're going to knock it out. You know, they are, they are not going to hurt your children and your, or your grandchildren. It just isn't going to take place. And so here God is telling us that all we have to do is put our hand in the hand of the one who has stilled the storm, who's calmed the sea, who is moving forward to move us into, into his blessing. You see, this is a powerful image of God's blessing as it shows us that phrase that implies being chosen. It oozes intimacy and fellowship as he takes our hand. You see, this lets us know the Lord is here to take us by his hand and bestow upon us rank in his kingdom to move us into our divine destiny, for us to be the people 
to reach this generation and to bring about the necessary change that shows the church what it's really supposed to be as we blaze for his glory. Amen? Well, as we conclude, you know, the Lord anointed Cyrus to conquer, but he also did something else in anointing him to conquer. He unmanned Cyrus' enemies. In that 41st chapter, in the first verse, where it speaks about the hand in the hand, it also speaks of the loosening of the armor of the kings. You may not have caught that, but I want, to, I want to just bring this to your attention. The loosening of the armor of the kings is synonymous to this. This is a direct statement about belts coming undone. It's about an enemy force surging to take your head off, sword drawn, in battle, and where it looks like you're going to be overwhelmed, where the enemy is going to have victory. And as the enemy is running, the, the, enemy of the enemy's army is running toward you with swords drawn, just waiting to get close enough to lop your head off, the Lord causes the belt buckles to unloosen. With the loosening of the belt buckle, the pants and the underwear drop down to the ankle. Full, explo- full, full <laughs> exposure, <laughs> as, as our, our real estate agent would say, full disclosure. Full exposure. Everything drops, pantaloons and all, down to the ankles. The enemy trips and falls face first on the ground. And what was going to be your demise becomes a mockery. What was to be your demise becomes a laughing stock. What was to be your demise and your destruction, you laugh at. Because the enemy will not have his way. Friends, God is here today to loosen the belt of your enemies. He's here to rain open blessing down upon you, to release wealth and words of power for you to be seen as the blessing of the Lord. This is our heritage. This is who we are. That anointing that we possess has an intrinsic quality about it that helps us in the achievement of our attaining that place of victory in life and where even though it seems we are going to lose, right at that crucial moment, bam, the enemy's on the ground and we're laughing at that open exposure. This is our God. This is what he does for his people. You will triumph. You will win because we are the blessed of the Lord. We are the ones who carry his presence and anointing and we will not be stopped. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you a question, a quick question. You know, if it seems as if the enemy has been running at you full bore, full steam ahead, with sword drawn, just ready to lop your head off, and, it, and, and the pressures are mounting, and it's really been difficult, and it's really been a struggle, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord right now. Yeah. As your hands are lifted, I'm going to make this pronouncement over you. Your enemy, his belt, their belt, is going to be loosed. And you're going to see your enemy come to an end. You're going to see those trousers drop, and you're going to see the circumstance change. There's going to be a change of course and a change of outcome because this is what our God does when we place our hand in his hand. He is our protector, our shield, our buckler. He is the one who brings us into his goodness and causes his promise to advance on our cause because he loves you, because he knew you and named you before you had been named. Because he is here to say, I am your God. I am your God. I am your Lord. And my blessing is here for you. So be it finance, be it health, whatever the circumstances are, I release the power of heaven. And I command the dropping of the trousers. I command the exposure of the enemy. And for the enemy to be made a byword. And that the terror of night will no longer 
be there to cause you grief and to cause you concern in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, Floodgate, we bless your coming in and your going out. We pronounce his name over you and we bless you as the children of the Lord. Please make sure you stop and get some of the treats, fathers, that are out there. There's root beer floats and candy and all kinds of other stuff because we want to honor the fathers, the dads, the children, and there's usually enough for everyone. So uh, that's just kind of the way we do things. And if you're here and you need prayer, our prayer team is here to join their faith with yours to see the victory accomplished in your life. Just come forward and they're here to lay hands on you and to pray for you and to bring blessing into your life. God bless you, Floodgate and friends. We'll see you soon.